in Latin America. Uh, as is obvious, what do these batteries do here? Uh, has a millennia old history of intercultural contact and therefore of cultural diplomacy as well. And hopefully for another millennia it's going to have one too. Uh, just imagine that today in America about 1,000 languages are spoken. Uh, if we try to count together how many languages we know, I think we will not reach much far away from Western European languages, about four or five. Maybe somebody knows also Quechua and Nahua, and then there are still about uh, 990 languages left. So um, this cultural heterogeneity and its implications, political implications, possibilities, is subject of my speech here. As can be seen on this map, 1,000 years before Christ, the continent known today as America was inhabited by a vast majority of hunter and gatherer societies, while only a very small part was settled by agricultural societies. Within time, agricultural practices spread over larger areas, especially to Northern America and the Amazon. The green areas shown on the map uh, where agriculture has a long tradition, later became the centers of great civilizations that are known to Europeans as Aztecs, Maya, and Inca. I expect everybody to have heard these names before. Uh, some of the world's most important food crops, like corn, uh, potatoes, or tomatoes, were domesticated by the ancestors of these uh, empires, uh, and the European cuisine would be unthinkable today without these crops. Nonetheless, as can be seen on this map, uh, most of the part was inhabited by societies that did not rely on crop farming for their subsistence. Even where agricultural practices were introduced since 1000 before Christ, they served mainly as an additional food income to, for the people, while hunting and gathering remained an important subsistence practice. When the Spaniards entered the scene, they were deeply impressed by the richness of the aboriginal empires of Aztecs and Inca. Within a short time, these densely populated and most complex organized societies were conquered by the military might of the Spanish Empire. Everywhere outside the agricultural region shown on the map, much smaller societies with a much lesser degree of social complexity and subsequent also much lesser possibilities of military mobilization nonetheless proved to be much more difficult to conquer. And even at the eve of independence in 1810, an estimated two-thirds of the American continent were still indigenous territory, only lightly spotted by Creole settlements that were hopelessly outnumbered by their uh, surrounding Indians. There's a sharp distinction between hierarchical structures and of domination found in states or in chiefdoms on the one side and the egalitarian societies based on personal trust found in small-scale societies like hunters and gatherers. In central Mexico, as in the central Andes, local communities were used over a long time to reserve part of their daily production for the maintenance of a small elite made up of warriors and priests. Therefore, the simple replacement of these vernacular elite by Spanish warriors and priests carried with it only a slight difference to former times. The people were just used to pay obedience. The egalitarian societies encountered by Spanish or other European conquerors outside these centers are much more difficult to describe in Western European languages. They have been labeled as stateless societies or acephalous societies. The term acephalous of ancient Greek origin, meaning without a head, uh, maybe best illustrates the problems for political anthropology to find an explaining expression that helps to understand the social organization of these groups, because egalitarian societies are not headless. But yes, authority is negotiated on a daily and not an annual level or even longer time spans, like, for example, a four-year election period, or whatever you think about a monarchy, for example. Uh, anyway, I give it a try to describe these unknown neighbors in the Latin American periphery in a positive way, instead of negative description as deficient political entities that lack certain organizational features deemed necessary in European tradition. 
when Spanish officials explored the vast continental mass of the American continent, they found it inhabited all over all. No region was a sociological desert, only waiting for crafty hands to be put into productive use by farmers. Population density outside the mentioned areas of pre-Columbian empires was anyway very low. Numbers are difficult to give, but hunter and gatherer groups seldom have a population over that reaches 10,000 people. But there must have been thousands of these groups scattered over the huge area of peripheral America. Could you change the image, please? Beautiful, isn't it? I'm a historian. I, I'm reading that stuff all the day. Uh, when communicating with egalitarian groups, the colonizers were looking for political institutions equivalent to their own social organization. When they failed to find a king, they usually concluded there would that there would be no political structure at all, and then try to impose their own idea of collective decision making. They did this by picking out a handful of male persons that proved to be most willing to communicate with the newcomers, and then missionaries, officials, or militaries went on to hand out signs of rule, like scepters, and to export a social stratification based on unequal wealth. The chosen governors or generals of indigenous collectives, for example, received a monthly wage and a set of clothing deemed proper in European style, that means a hat, a shirt, and trousers. As we can see on this, on this uh, picture, we have here the very basis of state building outside of, uh, outside of Europe. Uh, since not many people speak Spanish here, I heard, but not everybody, so I just explain that. This is uh, the distribution of land in the Concaac mission in northern, northwestern Mexico. The missionaries decided there must be a governor, there must be a capitan, a, cap a captain, a, a military uh, leader, and an alcalde, which would be a judge. Then they have here two signs that says Indio Distinguido. This is a, a special Indian for whatever reasons. Maybe somebody who speaks Spanish, for example. And then <clears throat> they imagine that they're going to do it like this. Uh, they give everybody, these Indios particulares, the private Indians, uh, like a male person. Everybody receives, there are 56 of them in the mission, obviously, and they get 56 pieces of land. So everybody gets one uh, size of, of land, all the same. But uh, the Indios distinguidos and the judge and the captain uh, or the governor, they all get more. The, the governor, for example, becomes three uh, pieces of land, and the judge and the captain become, get two pieces of land to make them different within each other, to make a social stratification, which is not part of their usually way of life, but this is what missionaries and colonizers, anyway, they imagine it. So yes, please. Somewhere show the size of the land, or no? Uh, it says their suerte. Uh, suerte is a North Mexican expression for, uh, um, how do you say that? And, uh, it's a certain size. There, there are uh, several uh, uh, sizes for that. Just imagine about uh, an acre, maybe, yeah? or about 100, 400 about meters, more or less. Um, so the problem is that in egalitarian societies, inequalities in power and wealth are systematically eliminated. Accumulation of goods is seen as an unsocial behavior encountered by social disrespect and the loss of trust by family members or other kinds of men. Each member instead is expected to share food, tools, and other goods with his kin, sometimes all of his people, sometimes certain members of his extended family. Leaders who definitely exist fall under the same rule, nonetheless. They are even expected to overview the maintenance of material equality without ever punishing wrongdoers with physical sanctions. When they fail, other parts of the society act out the ideal of social equality by simply moving away, leaving alone a greedy or brutal chief that, having lost his followers, is smoothly posed without the need to be killed. When these egalitarian mechanisms work, Spaniards throughout the colonial time were outraged. Uh, in their letters to their superior, the officials in charge with the with the assimilation of Indians, tended to mark a left-alone chief as stupid, as weak, or untrustworthy. 
for hunters and gatherers, these changes of leadership are no revolutions or no political crisis. It's daily practice. Not to be confused with nomads, oftentimes quite hierarchical societies, uh, foragers do not exactly change their residence frequently, they change the company. They have a, every member has a freedom of choice to move away from his current family cluster and join another one. This social mobility, of course, is an effective restraint uh, for leadership to become paramount or even prolonged. The freedom in the choice of company nonetheless guarantees a social relationship based on trust instead of domination or coercion like, for example, in our society. Those leaders who attract a large group of followers, therefore, are fully recognized in their authority. If they were not, the followers would leave, as is obvious in archival documentation about these groups. Now, maybe you're already looking out. Does it work? for dinner, there. I think you're not too hungry already. <laughs> uh, one important reason that makes the structure work is the fact that in forger groups, means of production cannot be monopolized. Knowledge of environment, the distribution of plants and animals, as well as the techniques of the exploitation cannot be effectively withheld from other members of the society. Therefore, a division of labor exists only among generations and among gender. Women play an important role in this division since their contribution to the nourishment of the family is usually higher than that of the man. In colonial as well as republican records concerning hunters and gatherer groups, officials recognized frequently that the men were very lazy and the women worked all the time. Despite this, this, despite this observation, colonial governors as well as missionaries refused to negotiate with women only accepting them as intermediaries in times of conflict. Once the women had arranged a meeting between hunters uh, and the military, they disappeared out of the archival documentation. Diplomatic relations between the cultures thus were artificially reduced to a pure male affair. Uh, in the year 2000, I just noticed because I did not have interest in that before. The UN Resolution 1325 recommends explicitly an inclusion of women into the peace negotiations of ethnic conflicts. This inclusion was recommended by the colonial administrations too. As one can see, it can take centuries to put a good idea in practice then. Or in law first, not in practice yet. So women's work in forager societies, as well as the work of man, consists naturally in hunting and gathering the daily meal of the family, as we can see. The foraging mode of subsistence requires a detailed observation of natural growth of plants, as well as the habits of animals. In contrast to domesticating modes of subsistence, from animal husbandry uh, to crop planting, foragers uh, do not control their environment. Their relationship to surrounding nature is renewed frequently by movements around the roaming territory. Um, but this nature forms only a part of the environment of human groups. Our research on the relationship between indigenous groups in southern Chile and northwestern Mexico, the pictures are from northwestern Mexico, as well as between them and the settlers of European descent, show that these societies also frequently pay visits to their social environment. The Mapuche of Chile, for example, organized huge meetings of local residential groups to regulate collective issues with the neighboring societies. Anybody heard of the Mapuche before? Yes? Well, at least some. <laughs> you did. OK. That is an, a, a native group in southern, in southern Chile, um, making up to about almost half a million of people or even more. Uh, these, uh, these meetings, also known as parlamentos, the Spanish later called them parlamentos, like our parliament, uh, came to include the Spanish government of the Capitania de Chile and after independence, the Republican government of Chile. The CONCAAC, these are pictures of the CONCAAC, a forager group of Sonora, irregularly visited their indigenous neighbors like the Yaqui and from colonial times well into the 19th century, also the settlements of their Mexican neighbors. These meetings offered possibilities to exchange good on the one hand, but especially to maintain contact and dialogue between the cultures. 
it becomes obvious that neither the Mapuche nor the Kumkak rejected their new neighbors, the Spaniards or the Mexicans, but included them into their social environment in the same way as they did with neighboring indigenous groups. This led me to the conclusion we had that before. I think that guy who was sitting here uh, said, when you buy a Mercedes-Benz, you buy German culture as well. I would even go further because I'm uh, going back in time that the, the people, they don't, they don't meet each other to trade in those times, in former times but they trade with each, other, with each other just to meet. This is the reason why they go somewhere. Everybody, every indigenous group is uh, living on their own, hunting and gathering. They don't need neighbors. They don't need trade to, to eat. We need that, but in former times they did not. So why did trade develop at all? Because people want to meet. That's my thesis in that point. For cultural diplomacy, if you want to put it like that. Uh, food exchange formed an important aspect of these meetings. Uh, the Parlamento meetings in southern Chile were downright feasts. In northwestern Mexico, no such feasts were held because of very different eating habits, as you might see on the pictures. As is known by ethnolog ethnological feedwork, the daily diet of foragers includes dozens of wild plants and animals. But to colonial agents or Republican rulers, these undomesticated dailies seemed disgusting. As one governor of Sonora, northwestern Mexico, said about the Comcaac, they are living in great misery and they really need help. Because there, in their roaming territory, they live on turtles and some species of seeds, and they eat that. Uh, Spaniards, as well as Mexicans, listed little by little a large amount of extraordinary dishes on the Concarque dinner table into the state archives, but failed to give them credit for their ingenious cuisine. Instead, missionaries and military worked together uh, to colonize the palate of the foragers, trying to change their eating habits from turtles to pork and from wild-grown roots and seeds to domesticated crops like wheat or corn. The Concarc, on their part, frequently informed their neighbors that they disliked the food offered in the mission and even became sick when eating in the Western style. There was little acknowledgement from either side to, concerning the taste of food. Modern nutritionists, however, confirm the forager point of view. Our metabolism is born out of a hunter and gatherer style of eating, which is recognized as very healthy and nourishing. Uh, can you show me the next picture? I'm not quite sure of it. Right. Ah, okay, I have explained that, sorry. Uh, what we have here is something only, special only for the Concarque. Uh, this is an Algier, uh, an Al Algier, is the, the right one, Una Alga? Una Alga, uh, the plants that are growing in the water. Seaweed. Huh? seaweed. Yeah, that's the, that's the word, thank you. <laughs> this is a seaweed. They take it out of, of the sea in, in April. This is only for a certain time, a seasonal food and then they dry it on the beach and they thresh it. This is a women's work. The women are, are threshing the, the, the seaweed and out of the seaweed comes a small grain, a green grain, and then they make a, a pie with that. Uh, it tastes, it's disgusting. As you can tell, it tastes like, huh? Zostera marina. Zostera marina. Yes, I want, just wanted to explain it. It's, it tastes like, a, what is that green? Nori. Nori, like a, like a soup made of that paper around sushi. These are fruits of a cactus, also a seasonal food. At the end of June, beginning of July, all over the Mexican-American uh, border, all these cactus uh, that are also in Mexico, we know that, uh, all these cactus bear fruits for a month or two because the raining season begins. And then there are, there are millions of these cactus, and on every cactus there are dozens of this fruit, and everybody is happy. In former times, you can, uh, the, the missionaries noticed that they were, uh, that the Kunkak started to, to make feasts in these times. They came together because it was possible for many people to live on one, in one place because it was everything full of this fruit, and they make a wine out of it, which, uh, is well in, in a few days. I could taste that wine too. That was good. The wine is good. Uh, here you see turtles. 
they don't eat that anymore. Since uh, 10 or 15 years, they, they started to make aqua farming in Sinaloa, which is south from, from Sonora on the Pacific coast. Sinaloa is the place where the drugs come from. We heard that before, too. Uh, the Sinaloa cartel. Whatever. In Sinaloa, they started to make aqua farming, putting antibiotica into the water to keep the shrimps healthy. And then the antibiotica is going up into the Gulf of California, killing the the seaweed and the plankton over there, and the turtles were feeding on these plankton, so they are not coming there anymore. And here, yeah, I said that monopolizing uh, the mode of production is not possible. We can see here a little boy learning how to use a bow and arrow. This is from about 1910, the photograph. And there you see the women who just come from collecting these cactus fruits. They carry it on the head on a self-made basket, and they have huge sticks to get the fruits from the also huge uh, cactus. Sorry? Uh, uh, they are different. This is from the saguaro cactus. And now don't ask me what the fruit is especially called. Of course, they have a known name in the language that is quite hard to pronounce. Cactus feige. Cactus feige, it's something very similar, yeah. There are different kinds of that, but more or less. Fig, yeah. I think you can get nopales here in, in, in Germany, in Karstadt. <laughs> they sell stuff like that <laughs> from Brazil and other. Uh, the trade that they carried out with, uh, no, I'm not sure if I, if I understood your question. You said like these trades are not are only meant to, to um, get together? To meet each other, yeah. Yeah, so do they have also its only trade or do they have any sort of, uh, does this play also a role to get them together for a longer time or do they make any sort of celebration? Mm. Ah, there's, uh, with the, as, I, as I said, w when these uh, cactus plants grow, it's possible for a large group to remain on one place. Uh, during other times, in, in, at least in the Sonoran Desert, it's not possible for more than about 250 people to remain in one area because there's no water and not food enough. So they have to uh, move away from each other all the time. But then during June and, and July, which is also the, the time when they celebrate their New Year's uh, Day, they can come together uh, with more people. But usually they, the indigenous groups in Sonora, they make their own, uh, they have their own feasts then, uh, not doing that together. But when they meet each other uh, by chance or, or, or willingly, then, then they bring something. But this is usually, most of the times, that we're hunting, uh, how do you say, the prey you know, of the hunt. So you could take a, a head of a, of an animal, I don't know what the name is with these. Uh. No. <laughs> Hirsch. Ah, deer. Deer, yes, of course. <laughs> the, t the head of the deer is a, is a very important uh, ceremonial uh, item. So uh, they, they exchange that. When you come with the head of a deer, uh, dancing starts almost immediately. Not anymore. I mean, this is former times. No, it's kind of westernized today. Um, okay, can you switch to the next picture? Thank you. So this is where I was talking about. I could have shown that map before maybe, but now it comes. Um, you can see where we are more or less, northwest Mexico up there. This is the coastline of the Gulf of California. So it's kind of surprising for all the intention or for many centuries of either assimilation or extinction of hunter and gatherers that they still uh, have survived until today. Of course, they cannot live like hunters and gatherers anymore because their uh, roaming area is much too small. They are now concentrated in these two villages, Punta Chueca and Desemboca, 
In former times, the residence was in this darker part here. That's where they lived. But to search for food and pray, they went knowingly, uh, they went into this uh, hatched area. Um, the major source of their income today is uh, renting out fishing licenses to Mexican fishers. They have an exclusive fishing zone in this area here around the island of Tiburon, which is the largest island of Mexico. Um, and the men also sell hunting licenses on this island where North American hunters, mostly Canadians, are very eager to hunt that desert bighorn sheep, as you can see why they want to do that, to collect that trophy, and they are willing to pay tens of thousands of dollars for, for a hunting trip of a few days of one week. Uh, the women still make baskets. You saw before that, that they had the basket to carry the fruits on the head. And these baskets, uh, are, these ones you can see up there is a ceremonial basket and they can sell it for several thousand dollars to, to museums in North America mostly. Some European museums, museums have that, but not so much. Uh, so you can say without exaggerating, they are not foragers anymore, but they are still hunters and gatherers. Obviously, that's where their income comes from. The relationship with surrounding Mexicans is quite tense. Uh, the wealthy citizens in Hermosillo, which is the capital of Sonora, uh, are eager to build hotels into the desert for tourists from North America. And the Mexican fishers are complaining about their restricted access to the fishing zone. One of the most desired maritime source resources uh, is the mollusk called Cayo de Acha, which is a kind of a shell, and inside you have almost a in the size of a fist, uh, a muscle, which is uh, 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 very expensive then. Uh, and this was tra is traditionally gathered by the Concarque and consumed in the family or marketed in the capital, Hermosillo. Uh, the, the Mexican fishers uh, receive licenses to go diving for Cayo de Acha with a Concarque crew. Uh, these diving expeditions go into deeper water uh, where more of the mollusks can be harvested. In shallow waters on, near the coast, uh, the, the women, uh, the Concarque women, they traditionally gather the protein-rich animal for home consumption or, as I already said, to market it, uh, to market selling too. Some years ago, that's what I wanted to tell now, uh, to stop, an interesting incident was observed by a Mexican ethnologist named Javier Basuto. Uh, it seems that the diving expeditions of Concar crews and commercial fishermen overexploited the mollusk population, and the women found much less uh, of this mollusk nearby the coast. When they complained to their husbands, uh, the men first refused to stop or reduce their luc lucrative diving expeditions, but the angry women knew how to enforce their concern. In open discussions of the issue between men and women within the villages, women started calling their husbands' names, making public little secrets of conjugal life, and ashamed their husbands uh, in front of their comrades. Some days after the incident, the Kumkak men threw out the commercial fishers out of their fishing zone to calm the upset wives down. And Within one year of very low fishing activities, the uh, Consejo de Ancianos, the, the, the elder council of the Concarque, was able to announce a recovery of the population uh, of this mollusk. Uh, so without any intervention from any superior institutions, a locally designed access to maritime resources prevented the well-known tragedy of the commons. Thank you very much for your attention.